Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me. I'm just a little working out what I can do to check. Oh, I can see all my panels. Now I have to take these off or they'll obscure the presentation. OK, sorry, a little bit of a delay there. But this is I'm Tish Shute. I'm the director of ARVR from Future Way Technologies, Inc. Uh, co-founder of Augmented World Expo and AugmentedReality.org and very excited to be at EclipseCon this year um, to talk about actually one of the what I feel is the most one of the most important topics and I'm calling it to start with the new web for spatial computing but as you'll see in the presentation I think it's even bigger than that. Please note that the opinions in this talk are mine and do not represent any organization or company. Um, a quick look back. Um, I'm one of the fortunate people who've spent my whole career working in spatial computing and looking forward to the future. And I began in visual effects for film and television, uh, working in motion control photography, which I'll talk a bit more about. I had the great privilege of working with Will Wright who in, on games and looking at the future of games. And I'm also the co-founder of Augmented World Expo. So back to the future, the early days of spatial computing. Um, this, what was so exciting at these times was that really we were just absolutely in the wild west of real time programming. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with Forth. This is a wonderful a quote about what it was like doing live coding in, in Forth. And essentially motion control photography is augmented reality for film. You are layering effects with repeat pass photography. And the next slide is just on the right is one of the, um, actually we did the software for this, the RGA uh, camera operator went out and did that shot for Predator. But I want to draw your attention to this um, quote, marrying cutting edge, edge technology with the acuity of ideas is the foundation on what RGA was built. And RGA went on from this, you know, early moment in spatial computing, they had the same cameras my early startup did, and became one of the biggest international digital agencies in the world. And as you know, you know, these very powerful effects have remained actually only in enterprise and advertising. And that's what the new web of spatial computing is about. It's bringing the power of these kind of ideas that take cutting edge technology to everyone. Um, and this is how long it's take. A lot of what we were doing with the Elecon was motion graphics on the web, um, not on the web, motion graphics. It has taken decades for them to arrive on the web. And, you know, this is this quote I, I found, I think is really, it's kind of sad that, you know, Adobe Flash was our only way to do interaction smoothly a while back. And it's good that it's gone, but we really, don't have a great situation for these sort of interactive and real-time experiences on the web at the moment, but that's changing. And I think I, this is a community, the Eclipse community knows how important, you know, the web's been and the open standards and the open source communities that have driven this to become, you know, really something that has changed everyone's, well, everyone has access as lives. And this is a very important moment. Um, this post was from the World Economic Forum last year, and you, everyone probably knows about Tim Berners-Lee's contract for the web. But half of the world's population is online, but most, you know, half are younger than the, than the web. And so it's time for us to sort of think, really talk about this and think about this. I'll talk about that picture later, but I will move on now. Um, so the, what do I mean by the new web for spatial computing? Uh, the new web for spatial computing is basically it's the convergence of many uh, new technologies and it's giving us the opportunity to go beyond interlinked pages and media to serve a new generation of use cases for uh, where the platform is immersive reality. And one thing I really want to draw attention to is the last sentence real-time collaboration between people, places, and things. And this has been a long journey on the web. The web really ha has, you know, be, it remained in its static form for a very long time. And it's not, you know, this idea of real-time collaboration has not yet really, you know, come of age. Um, 
this lively project is just one example of um, many projects that actually came out of very early days of computing and the work of Alan Kay and others at Arpa and Park. But this vision of, a sh of having a long view and looking at the past and crossing the silos, I think is essential to solving this problem. And, and I know, you know, in open source communities, that's what we're good at. We're good at like sharing ideas and crossing silos. But this is something really that if we're going to have a new web of spatial computing, we're going to have to do. And just a little quick look at the past, because Alan Kay is so important on this. You can see this video. They revived an old piece of software that they were being dumped by Xerox Park. They found it on a, and you've been thrown out. And so you can now see what they were doing back then. If you look at this video, um, it will explain why, uh, how they did this. But this comment, dynamic media has been demonstrated in a comprehensive way. We should not go back to imitating static media in, in ways that preclude dynamic media. And unfortunately, that's the story of the web over the last few decades. Um, and spatial computing, um, really, it's, you know, it's sort of grounded in this idea that we're going to bring all these new capabilities to the web. And as you can see, you know, we're not the current web, which has a lot of difficulty supporting this idea. This is an excellent paper, Future of Web XR by Web uh, on, on, on the Immersive Web by Blair McIntyre, Trevor Smith, Trevor Flowers. And this gives you a good, out, a good outline of some of the challenges. Um, Trevor Flowers has also a wonderful interview on VR for good because this is a very deep problem. If you think about how long it took to get the correct frameworks on the web, then, you know, it's to have news. We don't even actually understand all of the frameworks. We don't even understand what we're going to need in terms of frameworks for the spatial web yet. But Trevor's done very concrete work, including this work on potassium, and he's coined some of the language to describe this, like the wider web. So definitely worth looking up that interview. It gives a wonderful overview. Okay, browsers are broken. You've already seen this all year. Next browser war is going to be a goat rodeo. Um, but, you know, really the point is, under the hype, is that we really are at a point we have to rethink the browser. The browsers are so massively complex. They really got, I mean, they're almost impossible to maintain. And I actually don't find that goat rodeo is supposed to say it's going to be chaos and a big, a goat rodeo is a big mess. But a goat rodeo is also where lots of little modules goes and lots of children get to participate in something that's usually highly professionalized. So it might not be such a bad metaphor, but rethinking the browsers is a big deal. Um, and now the heart of my talk, which is, I think, one of this almost, it's just one of the most powerful things that have happened to the web in the last, in recent, in recent times. And this is bringing the web up to speed with WebAssembly. This is a foundational paper, so it, and by, uh, you know, a, a really strong group of contributors from Mozilla, Apple, and Google. And it explains, you know, really the thinking behind it. And, you know, these attempts to solve the problems that we've had with, you know, trying to have a, a have a safe, fast, portable, low-level code compilation target. Um, so this is one, you know, Going back to the beginning a bit, WebAssembly's come a long way since then, and many ap applications are ripe for disruption, are in fact being disrupted as we talk. Um, Figma has made heavy use of uh, 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 WebAssembly for their uh, design collaboration uh, pro project, and you can read their blog and learn lots about you know, what they did, why they did it. But many applications are ready for disruption now, and I mentioned some of them, audio editing, video editing, 3D modeling, mapping. And, and then there's a far future, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, it really, I think, you know, it's right now we've been given a key. It's a key to a door and it can open a very big future. Um, these are some of Web, WebAssembly takes the web way, way beyond what we are familiar, the familiar terrain we have associated with web. And these are some of the quotes of people's excitement. You know, it's just imagine some, you know, Solomon Hyde said that, it, you know, you can imagine a future, you know, uh, with uh, Wasson containers run side by side to, um, to Docker. So, you know, this is a very exciting moment. 
Uh, it's fabulously documented. Webley's, Web Assembly's post MVP Future is a, written by and Lynn Clark and Till and Luke. This is really a place to go. It's interactive. It will tell you where they are, where they're going because Web Assembly's made enormous strides, but there's still place, you know, stuff to do. I put this together not because it's that definitive about the good and not because this is very debatable. I found something as I get to know WebAssembly, that some things you think are a problem, but actually it's great virtue. For example, no direct access to web APIs, only access through JavaScript. That's actually what gives it this safety and security. Um, and so, you know, you can take some of this with a pinch of salt, talk to other developers, they probably say different things. Um, but anyway, it's, you know, and the, the SIMD is, I think, very close now. Um, so this is, you know, it's an exciting moment, very usable and very, you know, very on the way to becoming even more important. Um, so WASI is also very important because this is really the beginning of bringing this idea of a web outside our familiar terrain to everything even small devices. And it's a modular composable web. And that's a sort of core theme. And that's in the in the design of WebAssembly and, and WASI, that is, you know, what we've what we have available to us now and to support and to grow. And remember, I was really highlighting this notion of real-time collaboration. I think this is so critical. We've all learned this now, how we must have better modes of real-time collaboration. We have to be able to share rich experiences immediately. And we do need, these are some, this is an excellent blog um, from David A. Smith on Medium about the work he's doing in Croquet uh, IO, which is based on the tea time kernel. I don't know if you can read that in this font, but it says, utilizes client side shared bit identical virtual virtual computers along with reflectors that can act as shared clock but hold no application state. All users see identical updates simultaneously. Um, so you can go to both the site and the blog, they have an SDK and this is one amazing project they've been doing which actually uses WebAssembly and is shows you the beginning of beginnings of this modular spatial web. And this again, there's another blog on it on their website. Why, and this is Brian Upton from Croquet. Wide Wide World is a game project I'm working on at Croquet. It's a combination of Minecraft, Dwarf Fort, Fort, Fortress, The Sims, and Animal Crossing, but massively multiplayer. So you know, this is the beginning of a modular composable web for spatial computing, but what's critical because of Croquet in this case, it has this real time collaboration. Okay. So I didn't have time to put together a full array of the amazing open source work in spatial computing. There are so many modules, there's so much going on, that would be a wonderful paper to put together. Um, so and, and this is, you know, I don't, you know, because I'm going to very soon start talking about a much longer future, but this is now. We have projects, you know, bringing live coding to the web. Um, MatePad is a Rust coding, live coding environment that runs native and on the web. And it compiles to Wasm for the web and WebXR. You can find this on get their GitHub. Very exciting. The beginning, but it's happening now. And I just wanted to refer back to that picture we opened with, with everyone looking at their phones. I think our project for understanding what the spatial web is and what it, you know, what it could be, its potential, is way, way beyond screens. And this is another project that is really worth attention. It is a long future project, but this also comes out as, uh, uh, as influenced by the work of Alan Kay. And the main thing here is to get rid of screens and have really high band co co um, ability to collaborate and be with the, each other as humans while working with computers with our full array of communication skills. So I talked about this in several other talks and it's very well documented on the website, but it's augmented reality, but it's not with screens. 
Um, and again, this is another thing that why we have to, we have, when we think through the new web for spatial computing, it's such an opportunity to get things right too. And this is, I really agree with this, is the grand challenge, you know, of the, of the, you know, the, of, for actually the, the, the new web, that we really have to have, you know, socially and then ethically adept approaches to our networks, and particularly hybrid networks between humans and machines. And one thing I think is going to be very important is thinking about AI as a first class citizen in this spatial web and where we can think about, you know, those ethical uh, uh, aspects and transparency. And this is, you know, this is, there's several great articles on the future of AI, but these are just, you know, a couple of things that I pulled out that are relevant, I think. And I was particularly excited to see federated learning getting hot. I've been talking about this for a while. On the right is a slide that I created. It's from a talk a couple of years ago. But self-supervised learning actually moves us away from these giant big data cloud models. So this federated learning, which, you know, I'm going to show you now, <laughs> there's already work. And this is from the, uh, uh, the Apache TBM group showing that you can use um, WASM or WebAssembly and GPU to unlock the future of federated learning. So exciting moment. Now to get big, <laughs> this, was, this was the talk that I gave a talk, I hosted a conference at the Computer Museum called um, the New Spatial Web and the Future of yeah, no, the spatial web and the future of computing. Um, it was a very, it was a very, it was even more wordy than this. Yes, I, the new web and the future of spatial computing. And basically Alan started, he was so generously gave the key, keynote at this, this um, one day workshop. And this I think is something we really, really have to think about because I really took this to heart. You must have a great, I, all my career actually, I tried to be driven by this. You want to under, before you start diving into the weeds, have a great problem and have a great vision. And this is one of the great visions that's really, um, you know, influenced me now. Uh, it's basically this idea that we're, we're, you know, shifting into a new phase where it's a, it's a constructive phase from humanity where we don't have to extract and break down resources, but we actually can build at the nano level from these ubiquitous building blocks. Now that sounds very far out. I know some people are probably now going, you know, wow, that's way out, but it's closer than you think. And I've done several talks that, you know, look at this. And I think this is something actually really to think about. I mean, I love the, you know, I listened to the opening keynote this morning about from the Eclipse community, for the Eclipse community. And, you know, I think even the fact that you, the, the shift to the community and not just one platform is so important. And the way there's no distinction soon going to be between hardware and software. When we think of this new web, we have to think seamlessly, not only, on, only across lots of heterogeneous hardware situations that we currently have, but imagining a world where you actually, I mean, this is, I mean, I'm not, you know, I mean, this is very far out, but you imagine a world where the, the actual web, you know, this web of spatial computing can pick lenses that are actually sort of constructed on the fly at an atomic level and things like, I mean, this is a very big vision. And it's one I've talked about actually in a more narrow way, because, you know, one of the things as being a person who's their whole, my whole career has really been about AR, VR. And as I point out, I started off doing augmented reality for film where you use a computer to layer effects on, on, a, on, a, on a film reality. But, you know, when you're layering effects on the world and this, you know, all of the work we're going to do to have to have this AR, VR, and autonomous vehicles and everything, you know, this is going to, it would absolutely cook the planet. And so we, you know, when I, well, how I've been looking at this, and this is actually what's happening now, we're actually in the middle of a switch to a photonic, what 
we've sometimes called a photonic society. And you can see this very clearly, actually, if you're interested in um, AR, VR, like I am, you can see that we are now able to, you know, build these meta surfaces, um, meta lenses, and if you remember what I showed you, I, you know, pointed to the project of Dynamic Land, those are actually, they're gearing Dynamic Land, the augmented reality comes from, you know, projectors on the ceiling at the moment, but you could imagine in a photonic society, <laughs> the light bulbs will be where you can get your data and Wi-Fi, and that is closer than you think. Those kind of things are actually just on the beginning to appear. So I think now I can see questions. Do we have any questions? Hello? Oh, what is my favorite application of spatial computing? Oh gosh, I think dynamic land. I mean, it's very early, but please look at um, Brett Victor's, some of his talk and his work. Why I love dynamic land is, I agree with Brett, screens separate us, you know, and the whole room is the computer. You're part of the computer. And the fact that he started th rethinking this from the ground up, uh, I think it's just so important. I don't think we want to assume that we're, you know, essentially stuck in these uh, metaphors that we're used to. I mean, that's one of the big tasks of this is finding new metaphors for what we want to do with spatial computing. You know, what is what does it really mean to have reality or immersive reality as the platform for the for computing? Um, so I think that's, you know, that's my favorite. I think, you know, in terms of WebAssembly, you're beginning to see a lot of uptake by sort of fundamental sort of companies that are sort of early in spatial computing, like Unity use it, Google Earth has a big project. And I think we're about to see some very, very powerful, um, powerful projects. But again, I highlighted it in this presentation and I am absolutely huge on real-time collaboration, you know, and open standards and you know, I didn't mention it because I, was, I wasn't sure if I was going to have time, but I was talking about the contract for the web uh, earlier on uh, I, I, when I was talking about how important web is. And I just had a little you know, a link to the contract for the web. This is a really big project. And I think it's based not only on collaboration in the real world. Tim Berners-Lee sort of outlines all the important ways we have to. It's a participative project. But I'm actually very, very strong that we have to get our real kind collaboration on the web way, way better. I mean, that quote from Alan Kay that why we stuck with the static web for decades after Alan Kay, that was one of his earliest demos. <laughs> uh, okay, well, another question. Um, what is the best way for a developer to get started with spatial computing? You know, I would say it really does depend on your interests. Um, and I think, you know, I think, to be honest, I think because it really, you know, I, I would like people to start really focusing on web based spatial computing. I think there's so many reasons why it must go forward that way. So while I would say I don't like to say it's the best way right now, because it's early, you know, these things are emerging. But I would say for the long view, the best way is to dig down into these new tools, come part of this community, because I think the open source community and the developers in it are absolutely critical because I mean, it's my experience that in open source communities, that's where you have the artist engineers and the ideas. So I would say the best way from my point of view would be to get involved with this, you know, um, the web of spatial computing, web assembly, WASI, all these wonderful new tools we have. But if you're really looking to do something right now, I, I mean, that might not be the best way to get quickly to a project. But, you know, I think it depends also what kind of de develop you are coming, you know, getting involved in some of these open source projects. I didn't get a chance to, you know, I, I sort of rushed by it. But um, 
when I mentioned croquet, the they have you know um, created a, a interf a API so that you can bring in open source spatial modules and 3D and paint programs. There's I mean many many open source projects going right now that will direct the future of spatial computing, both for the web and if, if you know, if we're not, you know, before we've achieved that in other applications. So I think it depends what kind of developer you are, but I suppose if there's one takeaway from this talk, because I have just a few seconds left, is that, you know, we find a way from our own sort of skill sets or whatever to get involved and we become, you know, contributors to its growth. And, you know, I know, because I saw other presentations um, to the Eclipse community, I know there's been a lot of interest in Rust and things. And, you know, finding, I think, where you as a developer can use your skills best to move this forward, you know, because it's it really is that, but it's very exciting. And, you know, I hope, I hope, many people from the Eclipse community get involved because we are early and this is a time where it's not prescriptive, it's open. So my time is up. Uh, I was very, very happy to, I, it's hard not to meet everyone. I'd love to talk to people afterwards. But anyway, I think it's time to close out and I think I will have to leave, but thank you to everyone and hope we get a chance to talk again soon. <laughs>